Hello folks, in today's lecture video, we will discuss liver function test, LFTs. So understanding these tests is crucial for diagnosing as well as monitoring various liver conditions. So stay tuned for easy and essential tips to help you master the test and confidently interpret the results like a pro. Kindly hit the subscribe button if you haven't and let's get started. Alright, so albumin is a very important parameter for liver function test. And you and I know that it is the liver that synthesizes albumin. So in the case of a liver failure, this will certainly lead to a potential decrease in albumin levels. Meanwhile, albumin also has a relatively long half-life. So they stay in the serum for an extended period, making a decline more noticeable in chronic liver diseases. Compared to acute conditions where albumin levels may remain initially normal. So this highlights the significance of monitoring albumin levels as part of a liver function assessment. And it's important to also note that renal diseases such as nephrotic syndrome and also malnutrition may also lead to a low albumin state. Bilirubin and bile acids. So clinical jaundice typically becomes noticeable when the total bilirubin level exceeds about 3 mg per deciliter. And after unconjugated bilirubin is produced from heme, this unconjugated bilirubin is also known as indirect bilirubin. It is then transported by albumins to the liver where they are conjugated by the enzyme UDP glucuronosyl transferase. So this enzyme converts the indirect bilirubin, that is the unconjugated bilirubin, into a direct or conjugated bilirubin. From there, it is then secreted into the bile canalically. From there, it drains into the intestines. So it's important we see conjugated bilirubin converted into urobilinogen with the help of bacterial protease enzymes. Subsequently, urobilinogen is converted into stercobilinogen. And finally, stercobilinogen is converted into stercobilin. So in fact, it is stercobilin which gives the feces that brownish appearance so for example if there is an obstruction in the bowel analically or the bowel duct it means that there would not be conjugated bilirubin entering the intestines hence there would not be any stercobilin and this would lead to a more whitish uh, appearance of the stool again we also see that urobilinogen re-enters the circulation that is true enterohepatic circulation so urobilinogen enters, and once it is in the blood, it enters the kidneys where it is converted into urobilin, which gives the urine that yellowish appearance. All right, so as we can see, this is cholesterol, and bile acids are synthesized from cholesterol. And once they are synthesized, they are secreted into the bile. The function is to help digest and absorb lipids. Usually, they recirculate from the intestines into the liver. In hepatic dysfunction, it may actually lead to an elevated bile acids. Elevated levels of indirect bilirubin can occur due to various reasons such as increased production from factors including hemolysis, hematoma, or a decreased hepatic uptake. In addition, a decrease in the activity of conjugation enzymes could also lead to conditions like Gilbert syndrome or krigler najat syndrome, which further contributes to the rise in indirect or unconjugated bilirubin. On the other side, an increase in direct bilirubin or conjugated bilirubin can be attributed to various factors like impairment in secretion into the bowel canalically, or biliary epithelial injury from inflammations or toxins, infections, and of course, a ductal obstruction, which may come from 
a biliary tract stones, cholangitis, or a pancreatic cancer. Cholesterol. So it is the liver that synthesizes cholesterol. So in the face of a liver failure, that synthetic process would halt or would be decreased. So cholesterol levels would also decrease. And this is also true for hormones that are also obtained from cholesterol, such as testosterone. That level would also decrease in liver failure. Now, cholesterol is stored in bile as an excretory component, right? And so in the case of a biliary tree obstruction, cholesterol levels may shunt into the blood. So cholesterol levels may be elevated in biliary tree disorder. Protrombin time is a valuable parameter for evaluating liver function as it assesses the liver's ability to produce essential clotting factors necessary for proper blood coagulation. In cases of liver failure, there is an increased risk of bleeding due to the liver's inability to synthesize factors like factor 2, 5, 7, 9, and 10. It's also important to note that factors that is 2, factor 7, 9, and 10 are vitamin K dependent factors. So a deficiency in this vitamin can also lead to a prolonged thrombin time. Now, unlike albumin, these clotting factors have a shorter half-life. This further emphasizes the critical role of prothrombin time can be used in monitoring liver health. I think it's also important to mention that the INR, which is International Normalized Ratio, is actually equal to prothrombin time of the test divided by the normal prothrombin time multiplied by an international sensitivity index. So INR is usually around 0 0.8 to about 1.1. Glucose. Severe liver failure can also potentially increase the risk of hypoglycemia due to the liver's synthetic role in glucose production. So now that we have outlined the essential roles of the liver in synthetic as well as excretory functions, we will dive into discussing the patterns of liver injury. We will begin by focusing on holistatic pattern, which highlights biliary tract obstruction. And this generally is characterized by an elevated levels of gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, alkaline phosphatase, and 5-nucleotidase. Now, it's important to remember that alkaline phosphatase is considered non-specific due to its presence in various tissues such as the bone or the bile canaliculi. So disorders affecting bile flow or the bone can actually lead to an increased alkaline phosphatase levels, which makes it non-specific. So to differentiate the source of alkaline phosphatase, Gamma glutamyl transpeptidase right here can be used because GGT is rather found in many tissues except the bone. So it can be used to aid in narrowing down the potential sources of elevated alkaline phosphatase levels. So for example, you have a patient who has alkaline phosphatase elevated. And so you do not know if the source is from the bone or if the source is from the biliary tract. And so what you do is you would like to use GGT, that is gamma glutamyl transpeptidase. And if this is elevated, then you can comfortably say the source is from the liver. However, if alkaline phosphatase is elevated and GGT remains normal, then most likely the source of alkaline phosphatase could be coming from the bone. In hepatocellular injury, aminotransferase enzymes like ALT and AST are typically elevated. In alcoholic liver injury, ASTs tend to increase in a higher ratio compared to ALT, while ALT show more elevation in cases of viral hepatitis. Lactate dehydrogenase may also be elevated in hepatocellular injury. Thank you, and I hope this was useful. If you enjoyed it, 
then hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Bye.